Oh, there. RC, ring carcass, whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to go over the uh, summation of this uh, past game I've played here. We've had a few um, house rules involved, and I just wanted to cover a couple of them. Uh, the light cruiser, battle cruiser, didn't make a huge difference, but they uh, do seem to fit just perfectly between a cruiser and destroyer for the light. And the battle cruisers fit seamlessly between a, a battleship and a regular cruiser as well. Had no issues with them. We've used them a lot, and uh, yeah, nothing to say there. Um, the seaplane, attack and defense of four, seems to be fair. I started off with a movement of eight. But it was just absolutely way too extreme. Eight was too far. So we knocked that down to um, six, actually. Knocked that movement down to six. And it seemed to work just fine. Um, the cost at nine was uh, still slightly cheaper than a fighter. But uh, this gives you a bit of a variety on uh, unit types. And it... it came in a little bit handy being able to uh, do the combat air patrol range of two the longer movement with a bonus from a base uh, from a naval base giving you a move of seven that was handy and being able to land in a land zone with a base and then move the vehicle to the shore so to speak um, uh, that was no real issues with the seaplane when we had it at the movement of eight it became a little bit ridiculous at one point in time, I had a seaplane leave here and fly all the way in here and have a fight and then land at this naval base over here. It was just insane that a seaplane from uh, Nova Scotia could fly all the way into the Mediterranean, have a battle in Sea Zone 80, and then land in, in uh, Cairo, the Suez, in one turn. Yeah, that, that was just too much. So we knocked it down to uh, six from the eight, right? Six with the extra move is seven instead of, uh, what did I have there, nine or eight. But the extra move was nine. That was just too many. Too many, especially when it can land in the C zone. So that one's it. Um, technology, the bonus rolls, uh, that little house rule of general hand grenades where you get to give a bonus tech at the game start. It doesn't become effective until you're allowed to roll for tech in July 39. That one was nice. Um, I like that because it gives you a variety. It kind of randomly changes the game. It's not quite uh, a game breaker or game maker because it depends on what you do with that. But uh, that was a handy thing. And I always liked the uh, making tech available as per the normal rules for when you can use it but our house rule where we allow you to buy one roll per turn before July 39 and in July 39 we just default to the standard standard rules for the uh, tech can't use any until that date right July 39 but it gives you the option to uh, slowly work on whichever tech you want so if you happen to be somebody who knows that eventually I'm gonna want heavy armor or jets or something like that. You can creep your way up and work on that. The, that was a very handy little house roll. Very happy with that. Um, I've never actually combined, well, no, I've, yeah, I can't remember if I've ever combined the two house rolls together. It didn't make an insane change, especially when that bonus tech awarded is just a random D12 die and you get what you get. Um, that kind of spices things up a little bit. It's actually, Russia got, uh, I think it was uh, improved shipyard. So that's the only reason Russia had any Navy in the fight this time. All right, um, let's see what other house rules do we do. Medium factories, I do these all the time. I didn't find it to make a major difference in, in an extreme way. However, for example here, Calcutta became much more of a force because it had the ability to build three units here. Um, Japan had a much easier time moving forward because uh, for one turn less than five bucks cheaper than building two factories to build two units, right? Same thing. You could just upgrade the one you had and build three units. Same thing that was handy up there and really helped Australia out 
making them able to build more than one unit per turn. A lot of turns, uh, Australia was putting out two or three units. And if not, it was saving up money and building something forward on the build chart here, like a heavy cruiser or something. So it was handy for that. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. My convoy house rules, I'm not 100% sure if it was the best way to go about it. I know I went through a lot of changes. And um, at first I had it, uh, the house, the out of box rule there where the escort could attack anything on the line. And that was just insane. Because uh, an escort up here could attack anything on this entire line or that entire line. And the the unit being attacked by the escort couldn't shoot back. Right? So it it, it um, was too much in favor of the escort. So then I changed it and made it so that um, uh, you could only attack... If the escort attacked, you could attack back with the sub, right? Or defend yourself with the sub. And that was better, but I still found that you'd have five or six convoys on here. And this escort, if it, especially at one point in time, I had a battleship here on this zone. And that battleship there protected all of this line from London to Gibraltar, from Gibraltar to the Suez. And from Gibraltar all the way down to South Africa. That was just too much. Especially when it was a battleship. So it pretty much uh, rolled an 8 or less on every single sub that was rolling a 3 or less. And it drastically affected things. It, uh, it kind of blew my uh, whole system out of the water here. And made me realize that it was, it was a faulty system and I needed to change it again. So after that, I made it so that uh, escorts on the same line. So yes, the, this, this location here, it can defend all three lines. That's fine. But if your escort is here, let's just make this a quick visual aid here. If your escort is here and your convoy is here, oh, let's spin that around. There's no way that this escort on this line should be defending this line, right? So even though I changed the rules, so anything within two space or within one space, right? So this space and two spaces and the adjacent space, right? So that makes sense. But when I moved it to here and I was still convoying the same line to a South Africa from Gibraltar, this escort here shouldn't be able to shoot at this. It's escorting this line up here, right? This may be the pet place where the escort's based out of, but it's technically got ships all along the line, right? Now, if this convoyer is here, he's not just convoying this one spot on the line. He may be based out of that area, but he is going to be still sending convoy units all the way down this line, right? That's the whole point of the signifying of escort and, and uh, convoy rating. So, we just needed to have units with a specific... Uh, here. I'm just going to randomly grab something. I know it's Australian, but whatever. So this random unit here spread, you know, we just need the locations here so that we could uh, signify, okay, how do you attack and defend against each other, right? And that way these units could say, leave this line and move to a different line, right? But depending on how far most of them had moved, they are technically on this line, but they're more up here, right? Now, if they were down here, it would be unrealistic for them to next turn come into the med and attack something, right? That's just too far. And that's the only reason why they have a location that specifies where they are. All right. Um, otherwise, it gets too arbitrary and it doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm still in, fa in favor of the being able to attack the adjacent line. But since this is on a different or adjacent C-zone, right? So this escort here should be able to attack a convoy or there on the same line or a convoy raid in here that was on the same line that it's escorting, right? Not a different line. Otherwise, you can have a ship here attacking a ship here that's convoying into the Med. Not realistic for a Portuguese-based 
you know, Atl uh, Atlantic uh, units to be attacking into Gibraltar and being caught by these defenders over here. So that's uh, that was the ev evolving um, house rule on that that we I worked through as the turns went by in the game. And uh, yeah, I'm quite happy with this one. I think I need to give it one more go just to make sure that there's no other issues. And uh, I definitely discovered as the game went on, well, I already knew this, but I wanted to show this on the video here. Um, once Italy owned the Med with Cairo and Gibraltar and locked all the uh, allied units out of the Mediterranean, you really do need to go into the back of the book there. They got a bunch of alternate rules and use the Suez reroute. It takes these uh, values for the British and French or any other allies. Um, the Italians are typically not an ally, but whatever. And you divert them onto this line here, the East Africa line, or onto the uh, Cape Town London line. And you just split it in half and say, okay, so you had half of the British, which is an extra three, so they're four. Half of the French, which is one, so these guys are two, right? And then on this side, you give the British six instead of three, and the French one, right? And that's just from the Gibraltar to South Africa, and from South Africa here to Aden, all right? Just It just uh, makes it fair. Otherwise, it's impossible for them to get any escorts in here at all, except for right there, right? And they, they can't attack the convoying units. It just uh, does the same thing. It twists the rules and the uh, and the fairness and availability too far to one side or another and makes it difficult. All right. Um, let's see what other house rules that we have in play in this game. That was the convoys. That was the seaplanes, the light cruisers, the, he the battle cruisers or heavy cruisers, um, the tech rolls. All right. Now let's move on to... Um, China here, I had used that uh, alternate rule here where when the warlords get activated, so the warlords technically are any Chinese location that doesn't have either this symbol, which would be the KMT symbol here, or doesn't have this symbol printed on the map, which is the communist symbol. So what I did is I gave this warlord here, uh, notice they all have the same symbol, so I gave them all collectively together to the KMT. And then uh, this warlord here went to the KMT in Yunnan and Tibet. Um, uh, Gangzi. And then I also gave them Hainan. These both have the same symbol, so I gave them together to the KMT just like I did with that. The Burma Road affects KMT, so I wanted to give them this and also happens to be where their allies would be typically dropping off supplies and Tibet was also right next to it so I gave that to them the communists however have uh, friendly leanings with both the USSR and mm, the USSR um, puppet state of uh, Mongolia right so well I can't remember ignore that puppet state but Mongolia typically will align to uh, Russia if an invader attacks it so unless the invader is Russia but uh, there we go so I gave them Xinjiang and Zibay Ma both of them are individual warlords they do not have the same symbol they're one for one they do not give any extra monetary gain to the communists they do give them a bonus for this one here a plus one bonus for having something a territory that borders Russian control and at the same time, this bonus here would be given to, uh, from Yunnan, would be given to the KMT for their bonus income of uh, owning the Burma Road. All right, so that basically kept it fair and even. And all the income producing locations here, and from these three warlords up there, this one, this one, Yunnan, uh, Tibet was worth nothing, but I still gave it to these guys. That just... Um, allowed these guys here to move all these units as they wished to whatever would have spawned out of there and um, the KMT didn't really lose any power 
all the cam T loss was a few units here and I think one or two units there but they could combine with the communists here and fight together and it uh, actually made a huge difference in how it makes a huge difference in how uh, Japan can uh, divide and conquer typically Japan will uh, eliminate the communists either first or last and work on the uh, the other the other faction in here having both factions have an increase in uh, territory and units makes it harder for Japan to just wipe one out and leave the other one alone so that's uh, that's how that sits and that I don't find that this makes a huge difference it does just make it easier for that for the uh, odd time that Japan does end up having to leave China that um, the battle after the fact because the Civil War will resume between the KMT and the Communists, right? And giving them these two two land zones and their units just makes it so that should that happen, there's a more likely chance that both sides will be at a more even footing. It's the only reason for this, uh, that house rule. Um, it does at the same time, however, benefit uh, the, the total Japanese defense against China. So it's Overall, it's a positive for both factions of China while they're fighting uh, the Japanese. And it's a negative on the KMT, but the KMT starts off with every other warlord. And in the standard game here, it's just too much. All right. I, I got a separate video on that in my house rules, but uh, yeah, just there we go. That was the other house rule I was using. And I have two more, I believe. And one of them was the Netherlands fights back. Um, in this scenario here, Netherlands is kind of out, but it's not totally out. But yeah, this is the end of the game, so th things changed a lot. However, giving the Netherlands some money increases before they get attacked seriously changed Japan's ability to attack them. And it seriously gave... Um, the Germans pause when they attacked their home country over there in the Netherlands. So, I don't know. I found this one to not make a huge difference. You could still leave the Netherlands out of the war completely, never attack them, and then um, still win the game as the Axis. Uh, I just decided to go jump on it because at the time it made more sense. And then, of course, I had other issues going on with the rest of the allies and the russians um the third or the final one i did and yes that I, I highly recommend this otherwise the netherlands is making a bucket turn bucket turn bucket turn it takes forever they never have a factory to start by the time they get taken over they don't have a factory all they can do is build militias and colonials and what what where's the fun in that so russia I enjoy this one. This is probably my, my favorite uh, change to the rules. Um, even with the newer version, what is it, version 1.4, where um, the rules state that Russia may not attack South America because that activates the Monroe Doctrine and bumps the U.S. up into the war. Cool, whatever, fine. Leave that rule in there. It doesn't affect anything in the long run. Russia doesn't really need that crap. Russia was only coming down here anyway, and when we were playing our games, we always house ruled that, that didn't that uh, if it wasn't the Axis attacking, um, we never gave the bonus to the uh, Americans anyway. They had to earn their bonus. They had to earn their in income increase, right? That way, the Americans couldn't attack. It wasn't we we didn't allow it to be a loophole where the Americans could attack the Russians because they took one place one place for no reason there you go there's a russian place oh now the americans are at full income instead of six so now they jumped up to 60 something and they declare war on russia and now russia who was at eight suddenly has war declared on them because this is not a direct declaration of war on the u.s and oh look at that they both are at full income well germany hasn't even left its borders yet yeah no that's that's cheesy we never allowed it, but uh, 
apparently the wording in there somebody thought uh, that's an issue so the only reason we do the Russian one here and it's really easy the only change you do is you allow it to declare war on any power major or minor except itself and in January 39 the same date that it's allowed to declare war already and the only thing you take off from everybody's sheets I don't care whose it is the Americans the Germans the I don't know the axis doesn't matter but uh, any of the allied sheets the neutral sheets the Russian sheets you just remove fall of Berlin requirement that's it right the US when at war or when at war full income which is wartime economy may declare war on Russia after the fall of Berlin well you just take out the fall of Berlin done that's it it kind of makes the cheesiness at the end of the game where um, Russia can only be losing points via the Axis attacking it. So pretty much it makes it so that the only way that Russia can't win the game, especially if it's been very productive and taken a lot of land, is for the Axis to take it away. And the Allies can't take their points away. The only thing they can do is leave Russia in first place and knock down the uh, Axis and take second place, pushing the uh, Axis into third place from second. That's the only thing Russia, uh, the Allies could do then. And it, it makes it way too gamey. I mean, realistically, you wouldn't be allowing Russia to take over places all over the place. You know what I mean? Like, this game has been a little bit different because uh, Russia was allowed to declare war on the Allies without Berlin falling first too, which is ridiculous. I'm sorry. Forcing both sides to eliminate Germany. Unless Germany is completely completely getting focused 100% by both sides, in which case Japan's going to win the war for the Axis because the U.S. is not paying attention and neither is Britain. They're both focused on Berlin. Along with Russia, uh, there's no chance for anybody to attack each other. And it just a full-on press for Berlin. Always, every time I put, watched, uh, played a game or seen somebody try it in one of my games, uh, all that is, ever ends up turning into is a guaranteed Japan victory at the end of the game. Japan becomes such a monster that nobody can take it out. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't end up well. So that's why I take that. I, that's my favorite house rule. I'll use it every time. Remove the fall of Berlin from everybody. That's it. That's all you got to do. Otherwise, you change nothing in the rule book. Or on the sheets. It's just that simple. And what it allows is a true full three-player game where all three sides are, well, I don't want to get too comfortable with these guys. I don't want to focus too much on the, If you're the Axis, you don't want to focus too much on these guys. You start focusing too much on attacking the in India. Well, then Russia does this to you in the back door, right? If you focus too much on Russia, then India will come in your back door on this side. Same thing. If the Allies, which they were doing, focus too much on Japan, Russia can swoop in on their back door and look at the result. Right? Things change. It changes how the game is played. I absolutely love it, and it does kind of free you from the... Um, I understand that this is... a kind of an homage to uh, World War II and how things played out and whatever. But um, you cannot have a true three-player game or even a two-player game where you've railroaded everything with so many rules to follow exact historical instances. Individual players will purchase units and non-combat move units into locations in advance of what would have been the historical Battle of Kursk or D-Day landing or, you know, attacks uh, between the, uh, the Pearl Harbor or whatever. That may not happen. Or they may happen early or they may happen late or who knows, right? And uh, if you railroaded the game to follow an exact script, you know, instead of being a game where my decisions matter, 
it turns into a game where um, I'm not using my own skills and my own abilities to see how I could have resolved this if I was this party in the situation, right? So I understand the, the, the theory behind having the historical accuracy and I appreciate that, but you, you can err too far on the side of historical accuracy and thus um, basically kill any independent thought that the player has. And uh, that's why we have that remove the fall of Berlin because it uh, that one simple statement totally stifles gameplay way too much. Basically, it turns it into a two-player game where um, two two sides are on a team and they can't uh, they can't figure out they're uh, having a race for first, and um, the axis has to be crushed. In order for them to, um, or you have to crush Germany in order for them to fight with each other. And it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes, yes, some of our games, we do end up with a dividing line right through Europe. Right? I've had some games where Russia owned all of France. Russia owned all of Germany. Russia owned all of Italy. Why? Uh, Britain was so busy taking over the southern Mediterranean and the Middle East and uh, fighting with with navies outside of Gibraltar that, uh, you know, the Allied Axis had Gibraltar and everybody out there was, that was the Allies doing their thing and uh, the Allies were focused on a very heavy kill Japan first strategy so they didn't spend a lot of money on this side. As a result... Germany went for the sea line, it failed, and Russia just rolled in the back. And eventually, um, Russia owned all of the mainland and, uh, and in Europe, and the Allies owned everything outside. Right? Russia had the top half of the Med, Allies had the bottom half. Japan got annihilated. And Russia stayed away from that, focused no money on that at all, and they focused entirely on Germany and just crushed it. And that uh, that worked out rather well. But at the same time, Russia won that game hands down because it owned everything. And until and Russia was smart, it just encircled Berlin, gave the Germans that much money in Berlin just besieged the place and um, never took it over because that way if Berlin didn't fall the Allies couldn't attack Russia right so that was another cheesy way to win the game for Russia and the only way the Allies could take Berlin was either a mass airdrop or they would have to attack through the Russians which encircled Berlin Right, and which they couldn't do by the rules, so Russia basically manipulated the rules into a full on victory for themselves. All right, um, yeah, so there's some interesting points on uh, on house rules, uh, at least maybe you find them interesting. I know I did. Um, so yeah, we've had a lot of games here, and this one was a solo by me. Uh, a lot of weird things happened. Um, a lot of these I was trying to show with my house rules how Russia could do some craziness and not involve this here. I actually tried to <laughs> try to take out the Dutch with Russia, which would have left, uh, un unless somebody declared war on Russia, would, would have left the uh, Netherlands as a as a neutral country in the Axis and Allies battle. Um, but um, Strange things happen in this game. So, I'll leave that there. Um, yes, uh, that should be all of my house rules that I had incorporated into here. Um, there's one more house rule I typically use. I didn't in this game because uh, I didn't want to overwhelm everybody. But... Uh, I find it absolutely wasteful 
to have a strategic bomber that's allowed to operate as an air transport with a marine on it, but it can't operate as a trans air transport in non-combat move. Whereas an air transport can operate as a strategic in a, um, an airborne assault, but it cannot strategic bomb. I'm like, why have two separate units? I never use two separate units for that. I just combine the, the abilities of an air transport in with a strategic bomber. The rules don't really change. The only thing that changes is a strategic bomber can non-combat move one infantry type unit. That's a unit that's designed like a like the shape of a man. Does not have any vehicles. Or it same as an air transport, or it keeps all of its regular strategic bomber facility or abilities. That's the actual reason why on the, my videos, I'm using these little gray chips underneath the strategics because I had no intention of buying the air transports. I find them to be an absolutely redundant unit and uh, I don't plan on ever using them. I personally prefer to uh, just use a strategic bomber for them. Also, these uh, units here, all they lead to is confusion. Most of my games, I never use these coastal subs. I do on the videos, but uh, on the setup of the game, I just replace a coastal sub with a sub. I replace a light destroyer with a destroyer. There's enough neutrals and, and naval units and whatever throughout the map that uh, you cannot tell tactically what the difference is after the fact. If you started the game that way and you played, I've played many games like that, and then you play other games where you do incorporate the uh, the old the old tech of the torpedo boat destroyer and the coastal subs. I just don't find those units to be. Um, I mean, they do add some nice variety, but it just overcomplicates the game with not enough benefit, in my opinion, to have the extra pieces on the board. So, usually we will not use those. Other than that, um, that's pretty much our house rules that apply to this game. And I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to do a quick game summary here. I did the turn summary, but I haven't done a summary on the actual game. A lot of weird things happened. All right, bye.